So we are excited to be live again on this yes. beautiful Friday. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So yes, James here, integrative registered dietitian, environmental nutritionist, co-founder of Married to Health. And I'm Jelly Marin, registered dietitian nutritionist, and we specialize in gut health. So yes. we specialize in helping you, your fam, tolerate more plants, eat them, tolerate them, enjoy more plants in your life. Totally. And today our topic, so this is our, so for those of you, thank you first and foremost for everyone sending us messages and well wishes and everything. We've had crazy stuff going on as it does, and it totally relates to the gut, and that could be a yes. whole other topic of emotional stress and wellness related to SIBO and IBS. Today, the topic is uh, right exercises for SIBO and IBS. Uh, and just talking about kind of the exercise movement dynamics and, and how all that plays in. Um, if you we're, we're going live and we're saving these videos on all of our platforms pretty much. So every other Friday, we're live talking about a gut, typically a gut related topic. And of course, related to SIBO and IBS. So welcome back. If you've been watching these videos, that we really appreciate it. That's wonderful. We hope you're learning something, most importantly. Uh, and, and yeah, today we're going to be talking about exercise because a lot of our patients dealing with IBS and SIBO uh, want to still exercise, right? You still want to move around. You want to have that movement because it's healthy for you. Yes. But there's important context. There's things you need to know. There are things that can be helpful to the management and therapeutic aspects of your care. So we're going to talk about that today. Yes. And we are going to be answering questions. We've had a few questions asked in our group. Yeah. So with our patients, our clients with whom we work one-on-one, -on -one, we offer membership in our good gut group. And yes. so we have a few questions that they have asked, mm -hmm. and we're going to be answering those here today. Um, but it's an interesting topic because like James said, mm -hmm. too much of any good thing cannot be a good thing. And so <laughs> exercise really is one of those things. And yes. I've heard this with my patients before. I've had this with my athletes. I've had this with patients who might do um, long distance running, long distance training, um, long hikes, where long bikes, where they're going miles and miles, hours and hours. And they might notice that it wipes them out. And it also induces some IBS symptoms. It might exacerbate their SIBO symptoms. It might mm -hmm. exacerbate their IBD symptoms. So we really want to be able to teach you all about why that might be happening and how you can mitigate it if that is something that you are experiencing, you've experienced, someone in your life has experienced, right. and really understand that as amazing as exercise is, when it's extremely intensive exercise, especially endurance exercise, we're not hating on it because it's amazing. Wow. Endurance athletes, amazing. They are pushing their bodies to the limits, but you push all parts of your bodies to the limit, mm -hmm. including your gut. So today we wanted to talk about that phenomenon. And there is a phenomenon called exercise induced gut distress. Mm -hmm. Some people might notice that, yes, when I am on these long runs, when I do these long distance bikes, when I'm doing these really, really, really intense hit workouts for a long time, I'm doing an hour and a half of CrossFit. My symptoms are horrible after that. Mm -hmm. So that might be this exercise induced gut distress. And so different things are going to play into it. So Again, speaking back to the term, it's oftentimes there might be pre existing symptoms there. One might already have IBS, or one might not, and they might just experience those IBS like symptoms when they are exercising. Their SIBO symptoms might worsen when they're exercising. So, this is something that correlating your exercise to this exacerbation in your, in your symptoms is really, really important. And there are different reasons behind that. So, right. so, so. Physiologically, right? It makes sense because when you're exercising, you're not hungry. Like no one ever is doing an intense run. Like when I'm on a three mile run, even, or if I can imagine if I'm doing six, 12 or a marathon, I'm not going, man, I'm hungry. I really <laughs> wish I had a big veggie burger to eat right now. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, so there's physiological changes, right? The blood flow that was in your gut is no longer there. It is, I mean, not completely, obviously, but majority of your blood flow it's going to your brain, it's going to your lungs, it's going to your muscles, it's it's facilitating other aspects of your body. Your body is very smart. It can manage multiple things, but it knows where to send more power or more nutrients or more, more blood flow to where it's needed, right? So if you're already experiencing GI distress and you're doing these super intense workouts, 
a lot of your blood flow is going to be taken away from your GI tract and go to your muscles, especially your more outer extremities. So if you're doing weightlifting, you're doing push-ups, you're doing, again, that HIIT training, it's going to be going to your hands and your forearms and your biceps, and it's going to be taken away from your gut, okay? So it's important to understand those physiological mm -hmm. effects. And keep in mind, blood is important for motility as well. Mm -hmm. So if you already suffer with slow motility, slow movement or dysmotility, right. um, you know, movement in your gastrointestinal tract that isn't necessarily cohesive, now you're shunting less blood into your GI tract that can affect motility. So you might find when I am on one of these long runs or bike rides or one right. of these um, endurance workouts or this really intense workout, I'm super bloated. And so that might be reason number one. Behind it. Right. And then another, another aspect that's going on. And so you can better understand this mm -hmm. is mechanical stress. You're moving, you're jumping, you're bouncing, you're, you know, things are moving. You do have this mesentery system. You do have different tissues and different, even the way organs are placed to help keep everything intact. That's why when you go, you know, jump on a trampoline or, or you do go on a run, you don't feel like your stomach hitting up into your chest or something, you know, things are all jumbled around in there. However, if you're having sensitivities in your gut, if you're having that neurotransmitter uh, issue, if you're having serotonin issues, if you if you're highly inflamed in your esophagus and your stomach, and the list can go on and on, you're you're more sensitized to these shifts, to these movements, to these these mechanical factors, and that can further exacerbate things, right? It can it can cause just more stress on your body when you're really in the therapeutic and a healing space and area. Now you're just adding more stress and, and you, now you have to kind of do more to mitigate that, right? So yes. it, it's important to factor in all these, all these ideas and concepts and just be aware of this, right? That way you're not like, I exercise, I've been eating right, I've been following recommendations from this person and that person, nothing's, nothing's working. Well, you have to know, look, like Dahlia mentioned, so, you know, even a lot of good or what we think is good on one thing might actually be hindering you in some ways. It's important to understand everything has a time and a place. Everything has, you know, perspective around it that's needed. And, and it all fits together, you know, eventually, but Absolutely. you need that for sure. Definitely. Thank you for watching this. We hope you know by now, Married to Health really does everything we do coming from a need in our community, a need from our patients, a need from being dietitians for over a decade, from running our own private practice. And we continued that when we formulated Gut Nurture. So if you didn't know, Dahlia Marin, RDN, LD, CGN, formulated gut nurture along with complement. We truly believe it is a great complement for your gut health journey. Why is that? Well, it's low histamine, it's low FODMAP, it's organic, even the package is compostable. We really designed it with a patient in mind that is wanting to eat more plants, that needs to eat more plants, but is struggling to eat more plants. This is that bridge. We also designed it for the person who's just like, I wanna boost my gut, I wanna feel really good, I wanna help with the structure, function, and population of the gut. This is unlike anything that's really out there in that as it's focused on being a prebiotic, not really a probiotic. So the idea here, you can think of gut nurture as compost for your gut ecosystem. It's not trying to force seeds and the probiotics in, it's trying to create a beautiful environment and a beautiful foundation. So any seeds you get from the fermented foods you're eating, from your environment, from the beautiful habits you're building, whether you're working with us or not, they are going to fall on this beautiful, healthy soil with this beautiful, healthy compost and create a lush, beautiful ecosystem and garden, creating an abundance of fruit and postbiotics that are gonna keep you healthy and thriving. So click down below, learn more about Gut Nurture, and we'll continue with that episode. Um, so, you know, it is, it's multifactorial, it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. Our gut is not just our gut. It's not just right. the medium to transfer food through. You have your immune system that runs through your gut as well. Mm -hmm. um, you have your circulatory system. You have a, an entire nerve system. It's called your enteric nervous system that right. runs in and around your gastrointestinal tract. All of those systems are slightly offset when you're exercising. Right. And for most people, that doesn't set them back significantly. But for some people, they really do fine. When you are disrupting the function and the flow of all of those different systems, you might be having these different symptoms. Mm -hmm. So James talked about maybe less blood flow. 
that is going to disrupt your um, your gut when you're exercising. He talked about literally the physical movement of your gut and how that mm-hmm. might irritate and exacerbate and just bug your gut. So you might have this exercise induced gastrointestinal syndrome. Another really interesting couple of studies that I read, and we're going to share this with the members that are in our group. Um, you know, they have done studies that have shown around 30 to 50% of athletes say that gut symptoms are one of the most common causes of underperformance. Mm. 50 per, up to 50%. That's yeah. half, right? That's significant. So if GI symptoms are causing underperformance, why? Right. right. And, we, and we talked about a few reasons. Um, but what's interesting is mm-hmm. they did a study and they saw that we know that exercise is stress on the body and not all stress is bad stress, mm-hmm. right? Stress can be really good for you. It can really train your brain. Stress can train your muscles. Exercise is stress. And that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you're constantly in a state of stress with your gut or mental stress or or any other type of stress. Um, But that excess release of stress hormones that are induced, especially during endurance workouts, um, they can then cause the release of something called lipopolysaccharide, LPS. And lipopolysaccharide hasn't been implicated in leaky gut, right? Intestinal hyperpermeability is something that we can sometimes call it. And so for some of my endurance athletes, we might say, one, maybe we'll scale back on exercise for now. um, And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Or for some of them, I have recommended in the past maybe something to mitigate that LPS so they're not having those same level of symptoms. And this is something I've worked with several athletes, several of my patients who are athletes on, and, you know, we've kind of found the sweet spot for them. But I think that that is really, really interesting. So anytime somebody is in, engaging in this endurance where you're going above your, you know, about 60% of your VO2 max, that's usually, again, that high stress point for your body. And that might be when you're releasing more of that lipopolysaccharide, that LPS. And so this really paints a picture on the last point where we talked about physiological, mechanical, and then nutritional stress. Oh, we're registered dietitians, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So get into that nutritional stress aspect. And this paints a picture, right? Because we we know exercise is stress. However, uh, you know, context matters, like we said, right? So maybe... I got into an argument with Dahlia, right? And it's like, oh, we're stressed, emotional stress, right? So there's three categories of stress, right? Emotional, physical, and chemical. So maybe I'm in that emotional. Oh, we're fighting, we're arguing about, I mean, so many things to argue about, right? Uh, Kids and finances and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go for a run. So now you're, you went from emotional stress and now you're going to go for a 10 mile run and now you're hitting some physical stress. So Physical stress can encompass car accidents, surgeries, right? You're physically promoting stress on the body, even exercise. However, exercise can be beneficial. But in the context of you've had a lot of emotional stress, now you're going to go do some physical stress, and now you're getting the chemical, which is the nutritional. Mm -hmm. Chemical is food, liquid, drugs, alcohol, anything chemically you're putting into your body, right? So let's say emotional stress, yep. You did some physical stress to help with the emotional stress, but maybe you're still hitting on some nutritional stress as well, mm-hmm. chemical. Maybe you're still drinking alcohol. Maybe you're doing some drugs of some type. Maybe you're eating high fat, mm-hmm. saturated fat, fried foods as another comfort to all this other stress. And going those on. have been indicated and implicated in leaky gut, right? Those high saturated fat foods also can release endotoxins in your system, also can increase the release of lipopolysaccharides and other inflammatory molecules molecules that can induce that leaky gut for you. So, you know, the night before, or even the day of some of this really endurance exercise, where again, you're going above that 60% VO2 max, maybe that's not the time for a high fat meal. Or, you know, for some people who are maybe sensitive to certain FODMAPs, right? Mm -hmm. Certain fermentable types of carbohydrates. Maybe you want to pull back from those again, because compounded with the re- the stress of the exercise, maybe your body can't handle those foods right. that day or the day before as well. So those are things to be considering mm-hmm. in why you might fall into that category and that statistic of 30 to 50% of athletes who claim that GI symptoms are a part of their underperformance and their low athletic performance. And understand again, mm-hmm just like you're training the rest of your muscles in your body, when you are working your way up and going higher and higher with your endurance, your gut also is a muscle that needs training. Yeah. 
So give it that grace. Maybe it needs a little bit more time. Maybe again, like James mentioned, you want to put things into perspective and say, I slept only four hours last night. I'm going through a lot of stress. (laughs) I had a lot of coffee today. I ate a really high fat meal. Maybe I should, instead of going to my CrossFit class, that's 90 minutes. Maybe I'm going to do something that's a little bit lower intensity. That's not really stressing my body out quite as much, but is still going to help me build muscle or still going to help me lean. And that, that speaks to Mm -hmm. one of these questions. And I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but Someone in our group asked, um, what is the place of yoga Mm -hmm. and SIBO and IBS? Um, What types of exercises might induce that, you know, gastrointestinal discomfort that some might experience that exercise induced gut distress? So yoga is a great practice, Mm -hmm. you know, and and there are different styles of yoga. You can practice ashtanga, vinyasa, you can go to flow. There are so many different styles and practices it doesn't all have to be super slow. It can be one that you are sweating with, moving with. It could be hot yoga or not. Um, But yoga, I would say, is generally if you're like, okay, I I only slept a little bit. I'm super stressed. My meal wasn't on point. Let me, instead of going to that CrossFit workout I was going to do, maybe let me do a hot yoga class instead. Or I can't even handle the hot yoga right now. It's going to stress my body out too much. Let me go for just a regular room temperature yoga. Or let me do something like strength training right? Weight training, that can also be really, really great for that muscle breakdown, that muscle tear, and that hopefully you'll repair with your nutrition. Um, But strength training and weight training can be great and not too stressful. Um, Walking, jogging, um, Pilates, bar, any of these other kind of slower, low intensity interval training workouts Mm -hmm. or anything in that realm, that can be a little bit more conducive to your best gut health. Um, and my favorite in that in that category, especially on a really stressful day, or again, if you're on a therapeutic phase of your life, if you are <laughs> if you are working with a care team to help with something, right, with with a chronic disease and typically a gut gut related chronic disease, you're in a therapeutic phase of your life. Take that therapy with you in your movement, right? And and a win win with that is going out in nature, right? A beach walk or some type of hike in your local mountains or, or local desert, or, you know, whatever, wherever you are, that is a win-win and it's more focused and tailored to gut health in the sense that nature is helping to inoculate and seed your gut. Again, nature is where we mm-hmm. have received most of our microbes and our microbiota, the population in our gut. When you're breathing in the mist from the ocean, there are microbes in that mist. There are, you're getting those ocean microbes, right? When you're hiking and the dirt trail kicks up and you're breathing in that dirt, yeah, there's probably things you don't want. And that's why there's mechanisms in place for that. But there's also things you do want when you're smelling cactus flowers or wildflowers or you're smelling the trees, you're smelling the different sage bushes and all that you are seeding your gut. It starts from your nasal passage. It starts from your mouth and your throat all the way down to your esophagus, to your stomach. All of this is is a process, right? When we breathe and then I swallow, we are swallowing microbes. The, The air going into our nose hits our saliva, hits that moisture and we swallow it. Yeah, there could be There's most definitely viruses and many things, fungal spores and everything. We are getting a mix of everything, right? That's part of our system. Our GI tract is meant to be in connection with the outside world, not -hmm. not disconnected, right? So a benefit is you're doing a low intensity exercise. You can hike as as slow as you you want, right? You can walk on the beach as, as slow as you'd like. But you're also getting that nature effect as well, or what what some are calling nature baths, right? Mm -hmm. It's essentially inoculating your gut from your mouth or your nose to your anus, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's that win-win. So I love that. And speaking of that, again, not only are there healthy microbes in the air, oftentimes Mm -hmm. when we're in nature... You want to consider where you are exercising as well. Yes. You might be in a highly polluted area and that could be adding other stress. Downtown LA body. during rush hour? Yeah. Should I <laughs> might not be where you want to do an outdoor workout at that time, right? You might want to kind of recognize that 
I don't want to add that stress on, or, yeah. you know, if your gym is one that's like constantly spraying chemicals everywhere, that might irritate your gut a little bit, depending right. on your body and how well you kind of deal with some of those things. Right. So these are all really important factors. Um, and we'll quickly touch on just additional important factors and then what to do, right? Because that was another really good question that someone in our group had, what to eat before and after exercise. Um, so we'll talk about other contributing factors and then we'll end with what to do because that's why you're here, right? We're dietitians. We want to help you figure out what to eat before and after exercise very quickly. Um, but other factors that can contribute, like we talked about already, um, you know, the intensity of your exercise, uh, other stress factors that are going on in your life, your nutrition, your sleep. We talked about, um, we also want to always kind of speak on hormones, right? So we know that females can be a little bit more apt to having GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, estrogen, for example, can cause a slight increase in GI symptoms. So females, depending on where you are on your cycle, right? You might want to decide certain days of your cycle might not be the days for really high intensity exercises. Um, so understanding when your estrogen is, is at its peak um, and how that might affect your gut, right? Thank you so much for watching this video. We know you're probably getting quite a bit from it. It can be a lot of information, can be overwhelming, and we totally get that. Dahlia was there not too long ago, suffering with IBS and SIBO-like symptoms. She was hunched over very often, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, skin issues, hormonal issues, the list goes on and on. So we know this, we've been in practice now as registered dietitians for over a decade, and we created our Good Gut SIBO IBS program for you. If you're experiencing IBS, SIBO symptoms, IMO, SIFO, the list goes on and on. If you're like, I'm not really sure what this is, click down below. We have a free assessment for you and that'll likely lead you to our Good Gut SIBO IBS program, which is chock full of information we wish we had. It's information that we're giving to our patients. So it's all at your fingertips in one package. It's seven plus hours of video. It is dozens and dozens of handouts. It's tailored meals plans and recipes to truly help you get to the root, to truly help you understand what's going on so you can truly heal with each meal. Check it out down below. So we want to consider some of those things. Um, and then you also want to consider hydration. So we'll talk about food, but I first want to talk about hydration or lack of hydration. So there really is a fine line there. Mm -hmm. You want to ensure that you're not dehydration because studies have shown that dehydration can induce GI symptoms during exercise. Totally. So you want to properly hydrate. And then you want to be mindful of what you're hydrating with right? If your beverage is really, really concentrated in sugar, really, really concentrated in glucose, that also might kind of irritate your symptoms. And we can talk all day, guys. There's so many nuances with even in the topic of hydration mm -hmm. and the topic of exercise. So this is where we employ work with a knowledgeable care team who knows these details, who understands these details and can really tailor something that fits your lifestyle, right? And, and with hydration very quickly, I mean, just think when you're dehydrated, you get muscle cramps, right? That's mm -hmm. true for your smooth muscle inside of your GI tract as well, mm -hmm. right? So if you're getting, you know, your non-smooth muscle, your active muscle that you can control, I can move my hand, I can flex my bicep and all that, you can get cramps there. And cramps are not fun. If you experience, if you experience cramps often, I would guarantee your smooth muscles also experiencing some form of delay or cramping or is having some issue in it. And it's typically related to dehydration amongst other nutritional deficiencies and, and issues. So, so important. So there's so many important so factors. Important. So overall with, with eating, I think, you know, with eating, this is where we really, it, it's 100% tailored. This isn't medical or nutritional advice. But there are kind of some guidelines that right. we can talk about first and foremost, right? We know timing. Timing is so, so, so right. important. So like we talked about, you might not want to have a super high fiber meal the mm -hmm. morning of or even the night before a really intense exercise bout. But you generally want to consume, studies have shown about 60 grams of carbohydrate two hours before your workout. So there, those 60 grams of carbohydrate are going to last in your system about two hours. If you know, I'm going out on a five mile bike ride, then studies have shown that you might want to bump that up to about 90 grams. So if you're doing two or more hours, you might want to bump that up to about 90 grams of carbohydrate. 
again, then you want to say, okay, what's a lower FODMAP carbohydrate that I could be having? So you might consider doing a, a a blend and a mix of different things. Maybe those sports gels aren't going to work for you, or maybe a sports drink might not work for you. If you have IBS or SIBO, sugar. more fermentable, right? And you might then have symptoms from that. Maybe you're doing things like white rice you're bringing along, or you're having something like a white rice with some protein two hours before your exercise. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're incorporating other, um, you know, low FODMAP, but still healthy carbohydrates like kiwis, or maybe you're doing some grapes, maybe you're doing a little bit of potato, you're mixing it up with different proteins, you're having tofu or tempeh, um, mm -hmm. you're having a lower FODMAP legume. So that can give you that kind of 60 to 90 grams. So again, you want to eat about two, two, two hours, I would say, before your workout. Um, mm -hmm. And then we talked about, you know, a couple of ideas of different things that you want to be eating. Right. So this so. could be a lot of information for sure. And we get that. So again, working with the right care team, if this is you, if you're experiencing IBS, SIBO, work with the right care team. If you are maybe not on a low FODMAP diet, you haven't been formally diagnosed, you're just experiencing some chronic bloat or gas here and there, mm -hmm. then again, tailor what's right for you. You don't necessarily have to go on a low FODMAP diet. You don't necessarily have to really restrict and drop a lot of the high FODMAP foods. Maybe you don't even know what FODMAPs are. Go back and watch a past video of ours or you know, really find a good resource on FODMAPs that you trust and know is, is backed by research. Monash University is pretty much the epicenter of a lot of the FODMAP research or pretty much all the FODMAP research for right now. So Monash University might be a great start and, and continue from there. So again, we can't really cover everything in one video. Mm -hmm. That's why we break them up. But uh, we hope this is a great resource. We hope yes. this is helpful in terms of exercise and movement when you're experiencing so, GI Planning problems. your meals, again, two to four hours prior to exercise having those healthy carbohydrates, having some protein, considering the context of your life yes. instead of saying, but I signed up for that marathon. And even though I'm going through so much in my life, I'm going to complete that marathon at the expense of my gut health. You want to put the rest of your life in context. You want totally. to see what other stressors are around me in my environment, in my mind, in my gut. Mm -hmm. What else can I be doing to mitigate some of this lipopolysaccharide? Are there things that I can take that can kind of mitigate or bind or, you know, help me with some of that? Yes. Wonderful. Well, guys, if you enjoyed this, if you want to see a particular topic, comment below. If you're watching this later, no problem. Comment below. Let us know what topics you want us to talk and thank about. Thank you all. We got some very sweet comments. Yeah. Um, people are appreciating how we like to put the pieces of the puzzle together, break things down. And we hope that we've broken it down in a little bit more of a digestible way. Again, our entire goal, you guys... And our mission is to really help you eat and tolerate more plant foods. Yeah. And that is really the path to a good gut. And so we hope that all these lives, all this information that we impart helps you not only with if you're an athlete and this spoke to you, enhancing that performance and not being one of the, the a person in that statistic, but you're tolerating, you're keeping in the plants and you're chugging along. Yes. So remember guys, heal with each meal. Yes. We will see you the Friday after next. Uh, every other Friday we'll be here. And uh, yeah, comment, share this with someone you, you feel needs this. And uh, that would be wonderful. Have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend. We will see you all very soon. 